Part of the advantage of using Revit is the fact that it's built on a database. That database can query the information associated with each family to create schedules on the fly. To better illustrate this, let's go ahead and create a special kind of schedule, one that's called a column schedule. So let's go ahead and move up here to view up on the ribbon and select on view because we're going to be creating a schedule view, which happens to be a view of Revit's database. Now we're going to look for our schedules and it's this button right up here. We'll click on that. And then you'll always get this pull down menu whenever you're getting ready to create a schedule. In this case, we want to do a graphical column schedule. Now we really need to be careful here because if we blink, we're going to miss it. We're going to click and suddenly it's created the entire schedule. We're not going to worry too much about the message that just popped up for right now. What it's saying is that it didn't create a schedule for the two little slanted columns that were down there. And that's because they had some special properties associated with them. But for your typical everyday columns, your average everyday column schedule like this will just automatically on the fly. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we have here. Right now, it just looks like some just straight lines, which is basically what it is. And the reason why is because right now we're at a coarse level of detail. If we change this to be a fine level of detail, we can now see our individual columns. And what we're really looking at here is each and every column that happens to be at a specific grid throughout the entire project. So if I zoom down here, we can see the columns for A-1, A-2, A-3. And if they sit at that column location, then they're going to show up on the list here. As a matter of fact, if you'd end up selecting on any of these columns, you'll see the properties related to that specific column over here underneath properties. Not that you would ever do this next step, but I will state that you could even come in here and choose a different column off of the list. It automatically update here. It automatically update in all of your elevations as well in plain view 3D everywhere throughout the entire project. The reason is, is that once again, at its heart, Revit is just a gigantic database. So if you change the information in one spot, it'll update that information, those columns, those beams, those everything throughout the entire project. That being stated, we saw how fast it was able to create this. Now, this may or may not be the way we would want it to look. Now, if we wanted to have different sorts of line weights, line representations, maybe different fonts, all that can be controlled actually through the properties of the schedule itself. So to do that, all you have to do is click somewhere into a blank area and then look over here in the properties. Now, if we scroll down on the properties here, we could see a variety of different options. One of those things is text appearance. If you click on edit to that, this is where you can change such things as the fonts, what their size is, how they display, their widths, all that kind of information. You notice there's a tab here that says grid appearance. There will also be a button over here that has the same thing. And from here, you can change such things as what the actual dimensions are of these grids and that kind of information. I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel to this just to get out of the dialog box. You'll see there's also options here for include off shows as being GRI. Well, if you move your mouse until you just see this little black symbol that I have going on right here, you can click and hold your mouse button down and drag this column out to be able to read more of that information. In this case, it's saying include off-grid columns, so any columns that aren't necessarily on a structural grid. Also, there's an option here for do you want to group similar locations. Now, if you decide to group similar locations, what it's going to do is that any time that the same columns are going to end up showing up again and again and again, they can then be grouped together so we don't have this entire long list. All we would see is just those specific column conditions and the properties associated with them. So let's go ahead and take a look at that by just putting a check mark here next to group similar locations. You'll notice how on the fly this ended up updating. Each of these happen to be the exact same column throughout the entire project, which is why this went down to a list of essentially one. We can see it's grouped by first floor, second floor, third floor, and it's trying to push all those different column abbreviations just into one cell, so it's not quite wanting to fit. But you get the idea that by just putting a check mark here, you can make this chart be much smaller. Also, if we look down on these properties just a little bit more, we can see such things as what the name of this schedule is going to be. Moving further down, there's an option here for top level and bottom level. So if we don't want to see all the columns on this schedule, we just want to see between certain floors, we can specify that. There's also options here for column location start and column locations end. That's going to be between columns and you specify 
A1 or B1 and specify, you know, between those column grids as to which columns you want to see on the schedule. Now, one of the reasons why you might decide to do that is if maybe you have hundreds and hundreds of columns and there's no way they're all going to fit on a single sheet. By doing this, you can create essentially several individual schedules. Each one can have their own properties up there and each schedule could then show up here on the list and you can just drag each schedule on each sheet that you'd want to have it on. So by leveraging Revit's built-in database capabilities and it's being able to keep track of this being column or whatever kind of object, creating a column schedule is really an extremely fast process. A footing schedule is much like a column schedule, but it's created in a slightly different way. Let's go ahead and take a look at how a footing schedule is put together. To begin with, we're just going to come up here to the top of the screen, go to the View tab on the ribbon, and then we're going to create a new kind of schedule. This schedule is going to be a schedule and quantity schedule. In fact, it's probably the most common kind of schedule that you would use. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. Next, we want to be able to create just a new schedule for these particular footings. So we're going to come down on the list, and one of the things that you'll notice is that there really isn't a structural footing schedule here. So what we're going to need to do is a structural foundation schedule. So structural foundations, and there's two different ways to go about doing this. One's a schedule building components, and the other is a schedule key. Now traditionally, what you really want to do is a schedule building components. The reason is that this is the kind of schedule that will schedule automatically based on the properties of the objects that happen to be inside of the model. A schedule key, on the other hand, is a manually filled in schedule that you can take the time to just type in all the information for it. Every once in a while, you'll find a schedule key is more appropriate, but for this kind of work, this kind of schedule, a schedule building components makes a lot more sense. So we'll go ahead and come down here and click on OK. The next thing we need to do is fill in the information that's going to actually be on the schedule itself. The first thing we're going to want to add to this is going to be the type mark. So we're going to move down here and select on type mark and click on add. The next piece of information is going to be the type. So move up here, find type and click add. Now we're going to do this for two more columns. One is going to be for width and the other is going to be for length. So this is all going to be reporting information about these footings. Once you have these in place, the next thing we want to do is go over to the next tab, and this is going to be the filter tab. Now, right now, anything that happens to be considered a structural foundation is going to show up on this schedule if we would just click on OK to that right now. And that's really too much information for what it is that we want to be able to generate a report on. So as a result of that, we need to set up some special conditions here that's just going to pick out those items that we want it to pick out. So in order to do this, we're going to come in here and we're going to set up a filter and it's going to be based off of the type mark that we put in here from fields from the step before. Now that type mark can equal or does not equal or can be any of this information we see here on the pull down list. But in this case, we're going to start with begins with. So we'll come down here, select with begins with, and the information we're going to enter in is going to be the letter F. And then we're going to put a little, and it's going to look like a minus sign. It's a dash in there. After we've done that, we're going to move over to the next tab, which is sorting and grouping. And we'll come back and show where this property is associated with those particular footings that we need to schedule. So we're coming here to schedules and grouping next. If we want to put this in a specific order, at this point we could. We could tell it to sort by the type mark or the type or whatever the case may be. For right now, I'm just going to leave this at none. But if there was a specific order we wanted it to be in, so it would be A first, Bs, Cs, whatever, then we could just do that by the type mark, for instance. All right. The next option down here is going to be either grand totals or itemize every instance. Well, in this case, I have so many of these Fs that I don't really necessarily need to itemize every instance. Just anytime there's one that's different, then I want it to show up on the schedule. So I'm just going to clear out the box that says itemize every instance because I don't want a 20 category long thing to have to deal with. But I will put grand totals down here. And uh, the reason is I'd like to have a sort of a total count of what all my different foundations are going to be inside of the project. I'll point out as well that there's a formatting as well as an appearance tab. Underneath the formatting tab here, we can see that there's a type mark, there's type, width, and length. 
If any of these had information that could be calculated, such as cost or total square footage or something along those lines, then we could put a check mark next to calculated totals here. And then when it came time to do the totals, like we saw here in sorting and grouping, it would automatically tell us what the total either cost would be, total square footage would be, that kind of information. Now we have all the information I believe on here that we pretty much need. So we're just going to come in here and we're going to click on OK for right now. Right now, the schedule is showing up as being blank. And the reason is, is we put that filter in on that second tab that we had going across the top, and it had the F and that minus sign right next to it. Well, everything is blank because there currently are no foundations that have that F and minus sign next to it currently loaded inside of the model. So that's something we're going to need to do now. If we come up here to the little house, the 3D view, and select on it, we can then spin this around by holding down the shift key and the wheel on the mouse, and we can see each of these footings that we have, or in particular, what we really care about are each of these rectangular shapes right here. And we want each and every one of these to be able to show up on the schedule. And we can see the properties for those on the schedule. So the fastest way to do that is to simply select on one, right click after it's been highlighted, and we're gonna select all instances of this kind of footing in the entire project. Notice how they all turn blue. In fact, even if there had been some off the screen since we selected the entire project, they would have turned blue as well. Once they've all been selected, we can go up to their type properties, and that's by clicking on edit type, and we can enter in some certain information about these. Now, in this case, it's gonna be the type mark. And in this case, we're just gonna do F dash. And now technically, we could put any piece of information that we wanted in here. The F is gonna stand for footing. The dash or the minus sign is just sort of the space in between the next thing. If we had 14 different types of footings, this could be F1, F2, F3, F4. In this case, I'm going to leave it blank, but there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't put F12 or any sort of number like that. And the reason is, is in that filter for the schedule that we originally set up, we, we told it to be a type mark that begins with F and dash. So as long as this type mark starts with the F and the dash, it'll show up on the schedule. We'll click on OK to that. Now let's take the time to go back to our schedule and take a look at it. So we're going to come back down on the list. We're going to try to find schedules and quantities under the project browser, and then just double click structural foundation schedule. And now we can see that it has the type mark of F dash. We can see the type of footing that it is, as well as the dimensions that are associated with it. Now I am going to leave the title of this alone, but if we wanted to call it footing schedules, all you'd have to do is come up here on the list, highlight inside here, and then you could just type in whatever it is that you wanted to call it, such as footing schedule. So schedules can automatically generate their totals on virtually anything that you want to schedule. All you need to do is specify the properties by which you want to pull that information and Revit will take care of the rest. Legends take their information from families already loaded in the project and allow us to create graphical representations of them to be used in schedules, drawing legends, and other things that we might need to be able to display in our projects. In order to be able to do this, we need to be inside of a legend view. So we need to create a legend view. Up here on the ribbon, we need to select on view and then look for the little legend symbol. And it's gonna be over here toward the right-hand side, and we're gonna click on legends in order to be able to create a legend. So select the word legend. Next is gonna be asking for a new legend view. And we're gonna to wanna to be able to call this, oh, let's just call this legend component. Next is gonna be asking for a scale. The scale is kind of up to you. We can always change it down here after the fact. In this case though, I'm just gonna change this to be one inch equals a foot. And click on okay. Now, something that I mentioned is that legends take the information from families that are already loaded into the project. In this case, it's going to be taking the symbology from those families, which is already loaded into the project, and we're going to be able to place it in this blank drawing area. When we do that, it means that we can start creating legends, different sorts of schedules, whatever the case may be, based on the images that we see. So we're going to come up here to annotate and click on the annotate tab. And the kind of component we want to be able to put in here is a legend component. So don't just click on the word component right here, but click on the little down arrow that shows there and make sure that you select on legend component. Once you've done that, on the options bar going across the top of the screen, we can see that we have ceilings, basic ceiling, generic. 
Well, what this is saying is that this is just the first of the different families that we have available to us that can be shown in some sort of either plan or elevation view. In this case, just click on that. And let's scroll down on here and see if we can find anything else that maybe we'd want to create a legend component out of or be able to say this object, if it looks this way, is this type of object. Well, looking down here on the list, one of the things that I think that most people are going to be able to spot and go, I recognize that, is going to be our structural columns. In this case, I see a W wide flange column, which is a W14 by 43. Let's go ahead and click on that and see what it looks like. Now, what we're looking at is how this column would look like in a floor plan view. If we decide to click in order to be able to place this, we can see there's the outline of the column. If we change this from being floor plan view to being front elevation view, we could change this to be right or anything else. In this case, just make sure it's front. And we're just going to click in order to place it, kind of zoom out. There we can see it from the front elevation view. Look at what it looks like from the left-hand side. You'll even notice there's a blue dash line that shows up going across the top of the screen. And that's going to allow us to line these different components up. And I'll go ahead and just click to place that. That being said, we could choose from any of these other things that happen to be on the list. If we wanted to see a picture of what the floor looked like in a section view, we could select on one of these different floors and move it over here and we can see what that floor is going to look like inside of a section view. Whenever you're dealing with these legends, we always have to remember the purpose of legends, and in particular the legend components, is to be able to show the way these parts actually look like inside of our plan view. If they would happen to change, for instance, if maybe this floor would get updated, the properties, the thickness of it might get updated, the legend component would update automatically and it would display whatever the latest changes would happen to be. Legends communicate the way items are represented within the project environment. Our legend components allow us to be able to place these things in our legends and know that we're going to have good, consistent quality. And if the symbology would change in the project, it will also change on our legend. In this video, we're going to show the process of creating a legend from scratch. In order to first do this, of course, we need to be able to create our own legend view. So underneath view, we're going to come up here and we're going to create a legend view. So select on legends. Then pick the word legend off the list. We now have the option to name our legend view. In this case, let's call it a symbol legend because that's going to be the type of legend that we're going to try to do. Next, for the scale, one inch equals a foot works just fine. So if it's not already the default for you, come over here to the pull up list and find the one inch equals a foot and select on that and uh, click on OK. We're now inside of our blank legend drawing environment. Now, since we're going to be doing a symbol legend, the kind of entities that we're going to be placing in here are going to be considered symbols. These are two-dimensional line work kind of entities that get placed here in our blank drawing sheet. So to find those, and because they're two-dimensional, we're going to come up to the Annotate tab, and the Annotate tab pretty much holds almost all the two-dimensional objects that are really inside of Revit. And from the Annotate tab, we're going to come all the way over to the right-hand side, and we're going to pick on the symbol icon. Once we've done that, we can look over here on the left, and we can see underneath Properties, we have our Type Selector list. And from our Type Selector list, we have a big, wide range of symbols that we can place in. This ranges everything from section symbols to weld symbols to typical notes. Most of that symbology is all going to be considered a symbol. Now, for this, we're just going to place in six of our symbols. We're going to put some text next to it, and then we're going to put a nice little title on the top of our legend in order to be able to finish it off. To begin with, let's go ahead and find our symbols. In this instance, I want to drop in a handful of weld symbols to begin with. So this is alphabetical, so we're going to be looking for our Ws, and we want to drop in a top weld symbol to begin with. I'll zoom in just a little bit so that we can see it. I will point out that any place that there's blue, you can click on it. And if you needed to put in any kind of information in those spots, you can just by typing in. So if I would select on one, click, and then I could type a letter or a number if I wish. In this case, I'm just going to leave it the way that it is. Next, we're going to drop in five more symbols. The next one's going to be the weld symbol both. Previous one was top. This one is going to be both. You can kind of see how they like to line up with one another. You even get this blue line here that says, yes, they are lined up. The one after this is going to be weld symbol back weld. So weld symbol. 
And now we're looking for back weld. It shows up right here. Now, they don't have to be perfectly aligned, but I usually like to do that just to keep things clean. There's weld symbol melt through, and that's toward the very bottom of the list here. And we can drop that on. There's going to be another one, and this time I don't really want to use a weld symbol. I'd like to sort of get away from doing that. And let's go ahead and try to put a view title on here. So we're going to look for the Vs. Here we have a view title. We'll drop this on. You notice it doesn't line up quite as nice and neat because of the way it's constructed. It's not the same kind of symbol, but you can kind of eyeball it and get it in the right spot. And then we're going to also place in a view reference right underneath that. Now, the next thing we're going to need to do is we need to draw in the outside border for this legend. There aren't any tools in Revit that's going to automate this process for us, but there are a few different things that we can do to maybe help speed this up a little bit. So the first thing we can do is we're going to come up here and we're going to use detail lines in order to be able to draw in the outside border of our legend. So select on detail line. You can select on whatever line width makes you comfortable. In this case, I'm just going to stick with medium lines. In order to make this a little bit quicker, we're going to come up here and we're going to select on the rectangle tool, click once, and then just sort of move over in this direction. Now what I'm going to be looking for is to create a box that's about 8 foot by 7 foot. That should be plenty big enough for all this symbology. In fact, it might be a little bit too big for all the symbology, to be honest. But it's just a nice, almost standard looking shape about it. Once we have an 8 foot by 7 foot box, the next thing that we can do is we can use our line work tool to continue on. And in this case, I'm going to select on detail line. And I'm just going to move straight down here on the side. One foot down, I'm going to click once. And then I'm going to move straight over to the other side and click. Now that I have that line there, I'm just going to copy this line down multiple times so that I have each of my different spots that I can put my symbology. So select on the line, come up here to copy. We need to have a base point for our copy. Also make sure that multiple is checkmarked and click here at the intersection of these two lines. Now, we're just going to do intersection of, intersection of, intersection of, or endpoint of, all the way on down until we have an evenly broke up symbol legend. Now, on one side, we're going to have our symbols. On the other side, we're going to have text associated with them. In order to be able to break this up in two, we need to draw yet another line. We're going to do it from the midpoint of this to this location right here. Now it gets to be a little bit easy. We can just select on all these, kind of move them all in one big mass migration on over here. I kind of tried to center this one up so I wouldn't have to adjust it too much. Next, select on one of these and just kind of bring each one of these into their own cells. You don't have to be perfect about this. We're not actually putting together a set of working drawings at the moment, but the more that you get into the habit of trying to be accurate and put everything in line, the faster you'll be able to build those skills up when it comes time to actually produce your own sets. Now that we get this up here, and they're all basically lined up with one another, we now need to put some text in each one of these describing which each one of these different items happen to be. So we're going to have four pieces of text that are going to be talking about welds and two that are going to be talking about views. So we're going to come up here and we're going to select text off of the annotate ribbon in order to be able to begin to label these legends. Now this 332nd aerial realistically might be the right size, but I want us to be able to read it very well on the screen. So I'm going to change this to be 8th inch aerial. Move over here and then just click somewhere around the area where I currently have my cursor. We can always move this later if need be. And we're going to type in weld symbol top here and just sort of click somewhere out in space. You kind of see it tries to readjust itself anyway. The reason why it kind of did this in this case is because right now when my text command, it was told to be aligned to the center. If we didn't want it to be aligned to the center, we could say align left instead, and it would have instead just placed it to the left instead of doing it at the center of the spot that we just picked. Not a big deal though, we can just select on it now and then move it to the right location. By clicking on where we see these little four arrows here and just sort of moving it over to wherever it is we like it to be lined up at. Now the next thing I like to do in order to speed things along is to highlight on this and just copy it on down because we can just change this text. And the nice thing about this is, is it's going to keep everything the same spacing away from the top and the bottom. So it's going to look uniform as we look at it here in our view. Now we click on the individual pieces of text, like in this case, it's going to be the weld symbol. And instead of being top, this happens to be a weld symbol both. 
This next one is going to be a weld symbol back weld. The one after that is going to be a weld symbol melt through. I'll point out that these can always be adjusted after the fact just by clicking on the little arrows there and just sort of eyeballing them on over. The bottom two are going to be view title and view reference respectively. And I'll just move view title over just a little bit so it's a little bit better lined up than what it was before. Now the last thing is if we want to be able to add some sort of header going across the top of this legend so it looks nice and bold and uh, everybody can notice it, I like to do usually the same thing. I just sort of copy the text up, place it here in the middle, type in the middle here, and this is just going to be a symbol legend. It's up to you if you want to make it all caps. I kind of like to make it stand out. And then once it's highlighted in blue, which it should be because it was already selected on, you can then change this to be quarter inch aerial. And now we have the larger text. I will point out that if we need to be able to just bump this just a little bit, we can highlight on one of these and then use the arrow keys on our keyboard. That's the nudge command in order to be able to nudge this over and have these things be a little bit better centered on our screen. So by using our symbols, text, and our line tools, we can create legends fairly easily and quickly for our construction document sets.